Grace, mercy, and peace be yours today from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we're looking at the Gospel of St. Mark chapter 10 verses 35 to 45 as we work our way through chapters 9 and 10, we come now to the third expression of Jesus to his disciples of his coming passion. And the third inability of those disciples to hear what he is saying and accompanied by a lesson in humility. We think perhaps back to a man by the name of Cassius Clay. Turned his name into Muhammad Ali when he wanted to avoid going to, uh, to the draft. Man, uh, on one of his most famous victories, danced around the ring shouting, I am the greatest. I am the greatest. Perhaps you remember Muhammad Ali in his heyday. So how would you define greatness? We have to ask today. How would you define it? Is it power? Is it prestige? Is it wealth? Is it fame? Is it being the best at something? How do you define greatness? Well-known pastor was invited to dinner at a wealthy Texan's home. I'm told this is a true story. After the meal, the host led him to a place where he could survey all of his holdings. He looked out pointed to his oil wells, punctuating the western landscape, and he said, 25 years ago I had nothing, and now as far as the eye can see, it's all mine. Then he turned the opposite direction, and he said, look at those sprawling fields of grain out there. Those are mine. Then he turned to the south, vast herds of cattle, and he bragged, they're all mine. Then pointing to the north, and the beautiful forest, he described, declared, that's mine too, up that way. The man paused, expecting this pastor to compliment him on his great success and his great wealth. But what did he do? He put his hand on the man's shoulder, and he pointed this way, and he said, how much do you have invested in that direction? The man thought for a moment, and he said, well, I've I've never given that much thought. How do we measure success? Do we do it as the world measures it? With possessions and titles and jobs and all sorts of other things? Or do we measure it the way God measures it? Well, we don't dare measure greatness by the world's standard, do we? That wealthy businessman had a viewpoint that's really common in our day as well. It's materialism. That's what American society functions on, and many societies around the world today do as well. The idea that the one who dies with the most toys wins is pretty common in our culture. We hear it and see it all the time. How driven are we to keep up with the neighbors when they buy a new car? Do we need a new car? When they get a pool, do we need a pool? When they get satellite, do we need satellite? Are we involved in that race for materialism? It's there from our childhood. It's in many Christian homes today. It's an attitude that's nurtured by Madison Avenue, by magazines and media, which we saw just this morning. And one of the makers, and all of the makers of those wonderful products that depend on our need to own things. James and John were respectable men. They were the Lord's disciples after all. Not only that, they were his best friends. They were his cousins. Their mother Salome was Mary's sister. They had been with the Lord for quite some time. We're just months before his crucifixion. He's now trying to tell all of his disciples who are following him that he must now go to Jerusalem and enter into his glory. And they're not understanding it. They don't understand what it is that he's saying. Enter into his glory. Well, not long before this, Jesus had spoken to a rich young ruler who thought he had everything, who thought he had done everything that was required by God in the law. And Jesus had said to him, sell everything and give it to the poor. 
Come follow me and then you will have treasure in heaven. And the man went away sad. Jesus turned to his disciples and said to them that they would be ruling with him and anyone who follows him on his glorious throne. They would be sitting on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And they didn't understand it. And now in the mind is this desire to have a substantial, successful, great and powerful world kingdom of the Messiah. That Christ now will go to Jerusalem and ascend David's throne and rule there eternally. And they're ready. And after all, they're one of Jesus' closest friends. It's James and also John. And so what's wrong with asking to get one of the good thrones when Jesus is seated in power? Lord, we want you to give to us whatever we ask of you. Hmm. What a question. What is it you want from me? Jesus asked them. Lord, let us sit at the right hand and left hand of your throne in your glorious kingdom of power. Lord, you are going to be the king. We want to be your deputies, number one and two after you, in the power of the kingdom, even ahead of the other ten, Lord. Pride. Ambition. We recognize it. We recognize it. It's a part of our fallen nature. There's nothing wrong with ambition when it goes in the wrong direction, however. Then it causes us to stumble and fall. Much as possessions can be a trap to that rich young ruler, they certainly were. And sometimes even family can be a trap. All good blessings of God intended for his glory upon the earth, and yet because of our fallen human nature, we always seem to end up marring the good gifts of God. They didn't understand that Christ's kingdom would not be a kingdom upon the earth, but it was the kingdom of heaven. And that that kingdom comes not by the sword or with cash, but comes with the glorious gospel of peace in the hearts and lives of men and women and children and infants who have been called through the word, through the gift of baptism into that kingdom and have the promise of the cross, the forgiveness of sins and all that it entails including already at the moment of faith eternal life. And no one can take that away from them but they didn't understand it at that point. They're still misunderstanding what's going on. They wanted a position of power. Well, Jesus deals with their request, not by correcting them sternly or rebuking them. Jesus gently directs their attention, their attitude in another direction. First he says, you don't know what you're asking. You and I have the perspective of history. You and I know exactly what Jesus is here to do. Jesus is making his way to Holy Week. He's making his way to the garden in which he was betrayed. That garden in which he cried out to God, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. But not my will. Thine be done. He's going to the cross. He's going to suffer for you and I. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. <coughs> Can you drink the cup I drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism with which I will be baptized? Can you endure the cup of suffering? The cup in the Old Testament could be joy 
and it could be judgment. In this case, it's judgment. God's supreme judgment against sin, the destruction of all who sin, the condemnation of the world. Can you drink the cup of suffering? No. And if someone came today and perhaps Jesus asked you, can you drink my cup? Knowing what I know today, I'd say, Lord, no. Only you can drink from that cup. Baptism into death. Paul uses that imagery. The baptism with which I am to be baptized. My coming death upon the cross. Can you be baptized with that death, that sacrificial death for the sins of the world? No, Lord. I cannot. I can only die for my sins, and even then I have no merit within me to be redeemed. Only you can be baptized with that baptism, Lord. I cannot earn it for myself. Interesting their answer. In Greek, just one little word. Here it's two. We can. They don't understand. Their pride, their desire, their ambition is all clouding. All of the sin is clouding their understanding. They're not hearing the words of the Savior and grasping their meaning. These lessons in humility the Lord brings about are only to point us in the right direction. When the Lord speaks of his cup, when he speaks of his baptism, he's talking about his suffering and death, his sal the salvation which he will purchase with his holy innocent blood upon a cross on Golgotha, the Mount of Calvary, where he will die for you and me. Not because he's guilty, because he is righteous and innocent, but because we are guilty. And we stand guilty apart from him. And we know already that when he lay out upon that cross, it was our sins that drove in those nails. It was us who spat on him. It was us who beat the crown of thorns upon his head. It was us who beat him senseless. It was us for whom he died. And why did he do that? Why did he do that? Not because I'm such a good person. Not because I can earn anything in God's pleasure but simply because God is gracious. Simply because God loves you. He loves you so much. He drank that cup dry so that you and I could be with Him. Forgiven. Redeemed. Restored. Forgiven eternally in this world and in the world beyond where he ascends and enters his glory because the kingdom of Christ is not about us it's not about the glory we acquire it's all about the greatness of the glory of Christ so his name might be exalted on earth that many people might believe in him and be saved and so we measure greatness by God's standard, not our own, not the world's standard. How easy to get caught up in that worldly view of success. We do it in the church. How many churches does your church body have? How many members does your church body worship? How much money do you pay your pastor? How many programs do you have running? Jesus asked for none of that in the scripture. And yet even in the church, worldly views of success. Jesus said simply, follow me and tell others about what I have done 
so that they may follow as well. You know, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. They were upset. Wouldn't we be upset as well? Of course we would. Imagine a situation where a mother is going in for major surgery and she's surrounded by her daughters and her husband who love her and they've just finished praying. And they're getting ready for the doctor to come in and her to be wheeled away. She might die. It's quite serious. And the youngest daughter says to her, Mom, if you die on the table, can I have that expensive purse and shoes you just bought? And her sisters look at her. How inappropriate. How wrong. And why did they feel that indignation? Because they were eyeing that purse and shoes themselves. And that's what's going on with these ten men. They not only are upset with James and John for asking the question, but they had hoped for great positions in the kingdom of God as well because they too don't understand. Their jealousy is driving them. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them? And their high officials exercise authority over them? Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus gives us family and possessions. God gives us blessings of health and so forth. The service that service is ever asking, Lord, how can I help? How can I serve you with the gifts that I have been given? It doesn't ask, when do I get more? Jesus points the way people in the world fail in their service of others. We fail in our service of others. The ideal glory and greatness, worldly standards have no place in our church especially in its leaders. It's different in the kingdom of God. Greatness, you see, in God's eyes is focused on showing love and serving others. And the greatest person of the kingdom of God is not the person that sits at table to be served, but the one who does the serving, the one who gives up his rights to everything in order that others might be cared for in love and that's what God considers glory. And this glory is contrary to our world's notion of power and authority. So, do you want to see what Jesus means? Then you don't have to look any farther than Christ himself. Who demonstrates perfect love and service. The one who deserves to be served, served the lowliest of the low and was born as a child in Bethlehem. He serves me, he serves you. He rescues and he gives his life, empties his life upon a cross. Paul says to the Philippians, or gives to the Philippians a picture of that attitude. He says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. There is the picture of greatness. There is the love of Jesus. There is God in human flesh actively and passively becoming a sacrifice for your sin and mine. No religion in the world other than Christianity will ever tell you that. Nothing in the realm of human existence will ever point you to that. There is nothing comparable to cross of Christ and what the Savior offers. Yes, Jesus, the innocent service, servant, suffered the guilt of my sin in order that I might be declared 
justified, forgiven before the entire world. I've been declared innocent of all my sins. I am now free to enter his Sabbath rest. And so are you, brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how God measures greatness. Children of God, whose sins have been fully paid for through the work of Christ and that mountain of Calvary, go now. Live your Christian life and serve one another even as Christ serves you. All the glory of Christ who saved us. For such loving service is great and glorious in the eyes of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to hear more on this or any other topic, please find us on the web at emmanuelnrh.net. Please join us for worship Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., Bible class and Sunday school at 10.30 a.m.